So, uh, so this is the, actually the third presentation. So I would like to wish everybody who's watching us good evening. This is the, uh, but first of all, I'd like to thank everyone who is participating to the Path of Billiard 2024, which is the fourth version of an online Congress dedicated to liver and pancreas surgery. I'm very proud that this subject has attracted more than 1,500 people enrolled for this event. Uh, I would like to introduce you uh, to first to our panelists, some very close friends actually that make the uh, uh, a lot of HPB surgery here in Brazil. And they have a lot of influence on international HPB surgery as well. So first of all, I'd like to introduce my close friend, Paulo Amaral, who is a digestive surgeon from Salvador, Bahia. Paulo, be welcome. Very happy to have you here once again this year with us. Your, uh, your phone is closed, shut. That's it. Thank you for this opportunity to stay with my friends and John that I have seen uh, doing many pancreatic robotic operations. Nice to be here. Thanks. Uh, the other panelist that I'd like to introduce you all is Dr. Belotto from Hospital 9 de Julho from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Also a person who had a lot of experience on uh, robotic pancreatic surgery. Hi, good night. Thank you. Our pleasure. Uh, next one is Dr. Cota from Rio de Janeiro, one of our, another very close friend and a, a person who had a lot of experience on all kinds of robotics, digestive surgeries as well. Thank you very much for have accepted our invitation. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you and uh, see John Martini, my friend, again. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the last lecture, the sorry, the last the last panelist is Dr. Fabio Macdisi from Sirio Libanese Hospital, someone that I had the opportunity to be in a surgery, a robotic surgery with him back in December. It was very impressive for his technique. Thank you for your presence here as well. Thank you, Dr. Nicoluzzi, for the invitation. It's a pleasure and an honor. Uh, to participate in this online course and of course especially in the presence of uh, very experienced surgeons uh, in the HPB field thank you thank you uh in the and the, the lecture is going to be about robotic pancreatic surgery and for so I would like to introduce you one of the most important authorities in the field Dr John Martini from Charlotte USA someone that I had the the opportunity to be last year at Barretos and I uh, was very impressive as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Martini, for the invitation and for the lecture. Thanks. Thank you very much, Joao, for the uh, invitation and to see so many of my friends from Brazil. Uh, I uh, I will be back in Barretos in June sometime for another course and look forward to ever seeing everyone in person. So I'm going to talk, uh, let me sh first uh, share my screen. Sure, go ahead. And uh, hopefully this works. So um, let's see. And here we go. All right, wonderful. Everybody good? Yeah. Okay, super. All right. So I was asked to talk about robotic pancreas surgery, and um, in the sake of time, as we have about, uh, let's say, 35, 40 minutes to talk, I'm going to focus on uh, Whipple procedure. Um, and obviously, I have disclosures. I do a lot of teaching for some of the robot companies. And I'll start with a warning. You know, when you start doing robotic Whipples, you need to be prepared, not just from pancreas experience open pancreatic surgery but also robotics you need to you need to have that experience in both these are long procedures and they have both a resection phase and a reconstruction phase which makes them you know twice as hard as say let's say 
doing a liver resection or or distal pancreatectomy. There's a there is a very long le learning curve. I think uh, certainly it's debatable the exact number, but uh, it's certainly most people feel that's somewhere between forty and eighty robotic cases. Complications can be very uh, common. Probably thirty to fifty percent of patients after a Whipple will have some form of a complication. And I think it's important to have experience doing these first. So for the younger surgeons on this call or the video, uh, certainly I think you need to take your time after your residency, after your fellowship to get some experience doing these. Um, on the other hand, I don't necessarily know that you need to do laparoscopic. I've never done a laparoscopic Whipple. So I think laparoscopic experience certainly helps uh, an open surgeon get transform into the robotic phase, but it's not absolutely necessary. Now, some of the key points, again, when I started doing robotics, it took me about six years to get to do a robotic Whipple. That doesn't mean that you need to do that in that long. And the time period that I was training was, was almost 18 years ago. So nowadays we have all kinds of courses and training and mentors that can get people through that. Probably a two to three year time frame is a reasonable time frame for a for a younger surgeon to get to do in robotic whipples. So we'll talk about this. I'm gonna, as I said, this is gonna be mostly a technical talk. I will get into some outcomes data towards the end. We'll talk about uh, patient positioning, port placement, some of the key technical steps. But before you get that, you need to have patient selection. I think patient selection is critical to starting out when you're just starting to do these cases. And the factors that go into patient selection are the tumor selection, tumor factors, and uh, the uh, patient, such as proximity to vessels, the size of the tumor, and then patient factors, such as comorbidities. Have they had a whole bunch of open surgeries? Do they have cardiopulmonary disease? Are they morbidly obese. Those things are all important. When you start out, obviously you start out with easier cases. Nothing is easy, but easier cases would be an ampullary carcinoma or a distal cholangiocarcinoma where the tumors are not on the portal vein. Easier tumors would also include things like cystic neoplasms, neuroendocrine tumors. But remember that those reconstructions are often harder because the reconstruction phase you're dealing often with a soft gland and a non-dilated duct. So it's a double sort, okay? Um, when I started out, I also, you know, I tried to avoid operating on um, more, let's say over 70, 75 years old. I would try to do, uh, you know, younger patients and you wanna avoid people with cardiopulmonary disease. Certainly pulmonary hypertension is an absolute no for it a minimally invasive procedure because of the um, the effect of pneumoperitoneum on cardiac return. You want to avoid those patients. Um, now, some of the instrumentation, uh, obviously over the years, um, I've sort of streamlined the, the tools that I use. So 15 years ago, I was using all kinds of different instruments. Now I use three instruments for a robot, the fenestrated bipolar, the, the the scissors, and a and a grasper, the vessel sealer that is available. I don't know that it's commonly available in Brazil because of the cost, but in the U.S., it's a very widely used instrument, and this helps speed up going through a lot of tissue because you don't have to clip or tie everything that we once used to do. Um. We have the locking clip, different types of clips, actually. There's the plastic clips, and then there's metal clips. Um, and needle drivers, obviously, those are important. And the stapler. Um, you know, you can certainly use a laparoscopic stapler during a robot case, but I, I find that having a robot, it allows me to do the stapling by myself rather than having someone have to be at the bedside. That's important. There's a lot of different tools that are important in, in doing this. And, uh, you know, having these vascular clamps really helps sometimes when you get into bleeding. I think it's important to have that stuff available. And a whole list of things that I use, like paddle retractors, Nathanson's, hemostatic materials. Um, I'll say probably the one of the most important and underused tools that I see is ultrasound. And I use... I just finished doing a robotic Whipple about an hour ago. 
And I ultrasound during that case three or four times during the procedure in order to identify the blood vessels and things that I can't see. Really important to do ultrasound. All the different things you need. These are the different tools. Now, the room setup is going to depend on if, whether you have an SI or, or now an X, because an X has a center uh, tower for the arms. So it functions very similar to an SI um, or an XI. And uh, that's really important. So for SI, or I'm going to substitute an X, if you have an X, you know, usually we have the patients uh, supine with split leg, um, reverse Trendelenburg, and we dock the robot right over the head of the patient. So we're coming over the head, arms are down. And that's how I usually would do this type of a setup. Um, so in order to do that, you have to, once the patients are intubated, you have to turn the table uh, per perpendicular to the anesthesia team. And so this is how the patients are, tables turn and, and the cart comes right over the head like this. So obviously this is an old slide because we don't have SI in, in North America anymore. Now, remember on the uh, SI, we used to have a 12 millimeter scope. Yeah. Now with the X, the, the X, it's an eight millimeter port. So you're going to eliminate one of the 12 millimeter ports. Okay. But I'll show you what port placement used to look like. This was port placement, you know, for me 10 years ago or more. Um, and the camera port is actually on the right side in the mid clavicular line. Um, the uh, umbilical port is a, an assist port. That's a staple port and your sutures and all kinds of things come in and out through that port. So that, that was port placement early on. Now, if you have an X, your port placement will be very similar to, on, I'm going to show you on XI, the port placement. So this was, again, port placement for an SI uh, years ago. XI, you know, you can dock from either side. It doesn't really matter. Um, and we, again, use some trend, reverse Trendelenburg, um, things like that. The We use one assist port on my cases, and it actually happens to be a 15 millimeter port now, not a 12, and I'll explain why that is. Um, camera port's in the same position though, but now it's it's an eight millimeter port. So that why is that important? It's important because you don't have to close that trocar at the end of the case, and it lowers hernia and pain and things like that. So the port placement now, this is port placement for me for a robotic Whipple procedure. The Umbilical trocar is a 15 millimeter trocar. All of those blue dots are eight millimeter ports. So you do not have to close any of those ports post-op. And furthermore, cosmetically, it looks better. And you could say, well, where do you staple from? We we staple from the umbilical assist port. Um, you can either, either use a laparoscopic stapler, you know, Covidian or Ethicon, or you can move, what happens is we'll move arm arm number three, this port here to, to this position and we'll use the robotic stapler here and then move it back immediately afterwards. Seems kind of crazy, but it eliminates having a 12 millimeter port off, off midline. This is what it used to look like. This would be um, a 12 port here. Now we use a 15 port and this is what it looks like. So there's a 15 millimeter cannula, that green cannula. That's my assist port. And when I'm ready to staple, and there's we only use two staple fires for a Whipple, we staple the duodenum and then the jejunum. The reconstruction is completely hand sewn, everything. There's no stapling reconstruction. So, what happens is that robotic stapler cannula gets piggybacked in through the 15 millimeter cannula, and we fire the stapler and then we move the arm back to the eight millimeter position. Okay, that's kind of a little, little top secret trick of mine. So now the technical steps of the Whipple, again, you're following a plan, but if you find an area, and this happened today, I mean, you know, I found an area, the, the inferior border of the pancreas right near the gastrocolic um, um, trunk of Henley, where the, where the gastrocolics go into the SMV, there was a lot of inflammation and pancreatitis. So I, I stopped dissecting there. I went somewhere else. I did the the top of the pancreas, the bile duct, the GDA. I went and did the coker. I did the ligament atrites. And then I come back there. So it's always, you have to be kind of fluid in the way you do things. I think that's 
the most efficient way to do it. If you get a difficult step, you move on and don't don't get stuck. Um, this is kind of seems like it should be common sense, but in the United States, about 10, 15 years ago, there was a common approach to doing robotic whipples where they would actually do the first part of the case, maybe three hours of the case would be laparoscopic, and then they would dock in the middle of the case with the robot, which to me never made any sense because you're losing all that time on the robot doing the resection, getting better with the, with the robot. So I always, as long as I've been doing this, I've always been at pure robotic case, the whole case. We dock the robot at the beginning of the case. Um, so that's the way I do it. Now, some of the way I do robot whipples, it, it mirrors the my evolution in my open practice. So I was trained as a fellow to do a standard whipple, meaning an entrectomy. I haven't done one of those in probably 10 years. And all of my whipples are pylorus preserving whipples. Um, I'm not sure what, what it's like in, in Brazil. In the U.S., it's about 50-50 uh, surgeons, pylorus preserving versus standard whipples. Um, we used to bring the jejunum or the biliopancreatic limb through the duodenal tunnel underneath the mesenteric vessels. And now I, I, I don't do that at all. The, the biliopancreatic limb is brought in through the transverse colon mesentery. And there are different reasons why. Um, there was a time in my early in my career where I was doing a pancreatic gastrostomy, and I really am not a fan of that. I switched about 15 years ago to doing PJs exclusively. Um, I think it's a better anastomosis for it, it's maybe more technically demanding, and it certainly has a higher fistula rate. But I think it's a better anastomosis. Um, and so all of this, all of these things have kind of slightly modified over the years. Now. The other thing I'll say is that, you know, like when you start out doing robotics, I was using a lot of the traditional sutures that we might use in open pancreas surgery, such as proline and PDS and silk and vicryl. And I don't use any of those sutures in my, my cases now. I found that they just weren't very, um, they don't handle well with the robot. So I use monofilaments like monocryl. Um, I do use some of the barbed sutures for certain things uh, and those all the, all the different things. So the key is to eliminate the unnecessary stents. Um, here's a, a good good example would be like when I first, the first maybe couple of years of doing robotic whipples, I would actually finish the resection. I would put the specimen in a bag. I would undock. I would take the specimen out. I would take it down to the lab. I'd go have a coffee and come back and redock. And that whole process took 40 minutes or more and so you can save a lot of time by taking out the specimen at the end. And if there's a margin you're worried about, you can send that. I was worried about the neck margin today. So I took a about five millimeter margin cut with the scissors. I sent that to the lab and fortunately that was negative. So you don't always have to take the whole specimen out until the end. I think that's maximizing efficiency. This is a busy slide, and I'm not going to narrate this, but all of the steps of, of a Whipple are in here. This is the resection phase, and I'll, and I'll show you the, the manuscript that that's in. Now, the reconstruction phase, again, the jejunum is brought up through the transverse colon mesentery on the right side. I find that's the least, the bowel will have the least chance of being compressed or kinked or obstructed through this window. Um, we start typically with a pancreatic anastomosis followed by the bile duct. And then finally, uh, we do what we call a DJ or a duodenal anastomosis because, again, we're saving the pylorus. So you're technically suturing to the first one or two centimeters of uh, the duodenal bulb is how we do that. Um, there's a variety of reasons why I like that, but not that important. Um, this is a manuscript we wrote about six or seven years ago. It's in Journal of Gastrointestinal Surgery, probably available for everybody online if you wanted. I will say slight modifications since that time, but the highlights of this were that it was purely robotic and it was designed to be done by one surgeon. So I don't need a surgeon at the bedside for what it's worth. And so that is certainly helpful for a lot of people out there. Some of the steps to become 
independent and autonomous, you need to know how to retract for yourself without using your fourth arm. And one would be suturing the gallbladder. Another would be using a Nathanson to retract the liver. Um, there's a lot of different tricks to doing that. Um, we usually start with opening the lesser sac. We use a vessel sealer for that, mobilizing the stomach, both the superior and inferior borders. Um, and, you know, this is a great opening move, you know, to stitch the gallbladder. Usually I'll let, you know, a fellow or resident do parts of the resection. And what this does is it frees up your fourth arm from having to re retract the gallbladder the whole case. We take the gastroepiploic artery and vein, and I often will uh, um, just use the vessel sealer for this, but early on we were clipping this. We were actually, used, before we had that, we were sta often stapling this, uh, and that's followed by the coker maneuver. So this is an early video, you know, pre-vessel sealer, probably this was on an SI, believe it or not, and, you know, you get into a little bleeder here, you've got a, a fenestrated bipolar and then we would actually staple the epiploics, okay? And again, because this is a pylorus preserving procedure, you know, we're skeletonizing. And I think it's, you know, important to understand how to do a pylorus preserving Whipple before you do one robotically. So if you're, if you're comfortable doing standard Whipples, you probably should stick with standard Whipples, regardless of the fact that I think this is better. So that's how we kind of do that. Um, stapling the Dewey. Uh, and then ultrasound, as I alluded to, is really critical in all this. Um, once we've divided that, that exposes, once you get rid of the, the stomach, you can now see the hepatodeuidine ligament. And then we ultrasound, we we do a lymphadenectomy, we, we take station eight lymph node, uh, which is hepatic artery lymph node, and that exposes the GDA. Now, there's a lot of people in the U in my country that uh, emphasize uh, stapling the GDA, and I never stapled the GDA. In almost 280 robotic Whipples, I've never stapled the GDA. It's always I ligate and then I clip. Sometimes I use two clips, but a tie and a clip is enough to for the GDA. Okay, really important. On the bottom side of the pancreas, then you have to dissect out the gastrocolic trunk. Usually this is ligated or clipped or divided to allow not just the pancreas to lift up, but it allows the uh, transverse colon mesentery to, to fall down, okay, away from the, so then you can see the superior mesenteric vein and the tunnel. Again, this is an example of the inferior border of the pancreas, and here's this uh, vein coming in. This is the trunk of Henle. If any any other venous branches going into the pancreas, I I like to tie these. If you put a clip here, you, which you can, the problem is it might accidentally be ripped off later in the case. So then you'll you'll have a big hole in the SMV, which is not a lot of fun to manage. It tends to make the case a little bloody. You don't want to do that. Now, once that's done, you do your tunnel. The neck of the pancreas is suspended from a tape. Um, and we'll transect it at, at the appropriate time. Uh, we usually go below the colon. I like to go below the colon and find my ligament atrites and measure the bowel, staple the bowel, take the mesentery, really important. So again, here is, we've got the neck of the pancreas. Sometimes there's an artery which needs, needs to be controlled. And this is largely done with monopil the scissors and cautery and we just split the pancreas right over the neck, okay? I will say that once you once I got more comfortable with this, I started using less and less cautery, and instead of just cut and let it bleed, the reason that's important is then you can see the duct a little better, okay? And this follows up with, uh, once you eviscerate the bowel underneath to the right upper quadrant, then we do the uncinted process. Now, the uncinted process is, probably one of the most potential for bad things to happen if you're not experienced. Again, you need to know the moves of exposure. Uh, this is a little bit older vessel sealer, but it's still a good video. Um, and this, you can see this patient has a real fat uncinate and me mesentery. And you, you need to stop an ultrasound. And what I'm looking for is that vessel there. That's the SMA. 
So I know where it is in my mind. I I'm I know how close I can be to this, okay? And as we come in here, it's awful tempting to just go through here with the vessel sealer, but you, you need to go slow. So we're going to retract the pank using a stay stitch. Okay. And then I switch from the vessel sealer back to the scissors. Why? Because the vessel, the scissors is a much more elegant dissecting tool. Okay. This is the angles of retraction. Now you can see in here, there's the SMA is beating. Now that you get into some bleeding and you have to be able to control the bleeding precisely without making the damage worse. So this is controlled with a monofilament suture. Okay, very precise. No, there's no panic and we control it. Now, this is probably the inferior pancreatic duodenal artery, but to make sure we're gonna ultrasound again. So I ultrasound again and look how far away the SMA is. So that that artery we know is not the SMA. It is the inferior pancreatic artery. You need to ultrasound. It makes you a safer surgeon in this setting. So what I'm doing now is I'm going to thin out the inferior or the posterior aspect of the uncinate. And then we're going to come in here where we got into bleeding. And then I'm going to put a clip. Now, I probably would be just fine with the vessel sealer, but I like to sleep better at night. So I know I've got a clip on that inferior pancreatic artery. Makes me sleep. Everybody's happy. No problem. Okay. This is a vein of Belcher. You know, you can take these with the clip. And now you're through the uncinate. And, you, you know, there's a lot of lymph nodes up here in the posterior hepatoduodenal ligament. We'll take those later. Okay. So that's the resection. So once you've done that, then the last job is to divide the bile duct. So then we follow the artery in the vein up. Make sure that the, you follow that right hepatic artery, especially the right hepatic artery, because it'll go behind the bile duct. And you can get into that easily there. Certainly done that. Um, the bile duct is divided last, okay? And that's how it's done. Once that's done, everything's put into a sack, one of these fabric sacks, put it away, we get it at the end of the case. The reconstruction phase, and I will say in most cases, the resection phase lasts about two to three, two to three hours for me, okay? Reconstruction phase takes usually two to three hours. So you do the math there, it's gonna be somewhere between a four and a half and six and a half hour operation. That's as good as it gets when I'm teaching fellows. And if I didn't have a fellow and I was just operating by myself, I would be faster. But that's not my job is to actually train people. Okay, so that's where we get into this. Now, the, the three anastomoses, they're done largely the way I do these open. That is, it's a hand sewn, two layer end to side with a running pancreatic capsule to seromuscular bowel wall. I use a variety of sutures here. You can use the barb suture. You can use a, a monofilament suture. I Today I used a Gore-Tex suture. Okay. So, but it's a running monofilament. And that's how it's done. So true, it is a, not a bloom guard, as many people do. Now the duct to mucosa is done with 6O monofilament suture. We usually use somewhere between four and six interrupted sutures. And I do use a stent, usually small stent, like a five French or seven French stent, depending on the duct, the size of the duct. Okay. Now, if I happen to have a patient who's got a massively dilated pancreatic duct, let's say it's a centimeter, I'm not going to stent that. I mean, you don't need that. But if I've got a three or four or five millimeters duct, I'm going to put a stent there. This is what it looks like. This is a longer video, but still a good one. This is using the barbed suture, the V-lock suture. And this is run, the, you know, beautiful older video, but this is a soft pancreas. And uh, this is the 4-0 barbed suture. Oops, sorry. I don't know why it always does that. So we're making our little mucosal defect there. And then this is the 6-0 uh, monofilament suture on a very small needle. 
and you can see the duct here is probably a I, I I would say probably a two millimeter duct at best. So there is no way uh, to cut corners with this. And there's no way I could do this laparoscopically. I mean, that goes without saying. I, I probably can't even do that open anymore. My, you know, my eyes, I'm getting older and I have a tremor. And so doing this open is no fun for me. That's a PJ. And then we run the, when, then we run the front wall. that's how I do a PJ. Okay. Just to give you an idea of some sutures. So that, that the barb suture that I was using, the, the B lock, that's a CB 23 needle. If you look at that needle closely, it's much thicker than the RB one needle that you may be used to on like, let's say a proline, a five O proline or a five O PDS. It's a thicker steel. So it's not a great needle to use on a soft duct, uh, whether that's a pancreatic duct or a bile duct. The TF1 needle is a smaller needle. That's the smallest needle that I use. It's a great needle. Okay. Now, what about the bile duct? The HJ depends on the size of the duct. You know, a dilated duct, I, I'll use a running suture. Uh, anything less than about, I'd say less than seven or eight millimeter diameter, that's going to be interrupted with monofilament. Has to be precise. You can't, here's a good example. This is doing an HJ an HJ on a, a Whipple for someone who had a non-dilated bile duct. I think this was like a, a, a young woman with an either a cystic neoplasm or something. But you can see that bile duct is maybe five millimeters in diameter. So this has to be done with absolute perfection. You can't run this. Okay. That's different than somebody who has a thick duct. This is not super dilated, but this is somebody who had neoadjuvant chemotherapy for pancreatic cancer. And I'm going to use the barbed suture just to expedite. And you can kind of get away with uh, running this when it's a thicker, uh, a little bit more dilated. Now you do have to be careful when you run these barbed sutures. You can, I think they have a higher incidence of biliary strict, post-op biliary strictures. So just, just be cautious with using this suture. I mean, it's very nice, but I think people overuse this suture in the U.S., okay? And then finally, the, the last anastomosis. This is done usually, this is a hand-sewn end-to-side anastomosis with the barbed sutures. Um, it's usually done anti-colic, so I bring the loop up in front of the, of the transverse colon, usually. If I have to do a standard Whipple, if I have to do an antrectomy, I almost always make an extra roux to bring a roux up to the stomach so they're separate rather than doing a loop gastro J because I don't like the, I don't like the bile reflux that you get with the loop gastro J. And this is what that looks like. So lift up the, the colon. There's your colon. There's my biliopancreatic limb. So we're going to measure a little bit of this. It comes up, over, usually comes up right over the transverse colon. Sometimes I'll make a window uh, between the colon and the omentum so that it's sort of sitting behind the greater omentum. And uh, this is, again, using the barb sutures. And this first stitch just suspends the jejunum to the back of the pylorus. Okay. And then we open uh, the, the posterior aspect of the duodenum. You, you can visualize your pylorus here. Um, get in there and clean it out. And then we make the enterotomy and the jejunum to match. And then we use another barb suture. This, this part of the case, you know, it can be tedious. I usually, you know, this is where I'm either letting a fellow uh, or a res, sometimes a resident uh, do this portion of the case and, you know, get through it, cut the staple line off. And then we finish the front wall. This is the front wall is just in one layer. So it's done with these, what we call Limbert stitches. It's almost like a canal. 
but this is how this is how I do this. I've just found that these patients do a little bit better than we traditionally had, uh, and certainly is my preferred technique. Now, um, when the specimen is done, we usually put that in a bag. Um, at the end, I usually use one drain, sometimes two, and the specimen's extracted from the, the, the 15 millimeter cannula. That's my extraction site. So I only have one site that I have to close. So cosmetically, I think it's the best. Um, now that's usually infra umbilical, but if I have a young woman for whatever, or young man, I guess, um, it's usually tends to be women with these things. Um, and then I use a super pubic extraction site. So this happens to be a, a, a probably a 45 year old male who had a, a big neuroendocrine tumor. And this would be port placement at the end. You can see the four ports across by the umbilicus. I've already got a drain in one of the ports and then here's my specimen. And so this is, you know, you take the trocar out, you pull the bag up, okay? And then, so this is, uh, how, this is how you get a Whipple specimen out through a very small incision. First thing you do is get, take the gallbladder out and then take as much of the jejunum and small bowel out of the specimen. So you have the smallest amount of specimen left in the bag. And then it just slides right out, okay? That's a Whipple specimen, believe it or not. I mean, it looks crazy, but that's the incision you can get. And, you know, this cosmetically, I mean, I don't think you can get any better than this. You know, for four of these eight millimeter ports, none of these had to be closed fascial, which really helps with pain. You just close the skin on the eights. And then this is my extraction incision. You know, some of the others that infra-umbilical extraction, I think it looks okay, but... You know, if I have a young woman or, or a young man, I'm probably going to do a, a little small little fanny. That's how we do it. Now, over the years, we've done, I think I've got about five minutes left, okay? You know, we've done a lot of research and studying in, in our experience. And, you know, we found, uh, one of the things we found recently was we looked at a, a, a comparison of robot and open. And, of course, we can't do randomized studies here in the U.S. because patients don't want that. And, and it's hard to recruit uh, to a randomized study in North America. But we did a propensity match study here looking at open and robot Whipples and um, just a small cohort of patients who had a Whipple for adenocarcinoma of the pancreas. And we looked at things, you know, pretty similar in terms of outcomes. I mean, the operative time, there was a little trend towards increased operative time and then more blood loss in the open. But remember, these are selected cases. One of the things that did stand out, which was surprising, was the lymphadenectomy in the robotic was higher significantly, even than open, which I initially didn't believe, and certainly my partners who do open surgery didn't believe that. Um, if you think, look at length of stay, there's a difference in the length of stay by about one and a half days. One and a half days in the United States in a hospital pays for everything, okay, everything. So when people start talking to me about cost, it goes out the window. Okay. If I can get home people home in one and a half days sooner, that's about six or seven thousand dollars US in terms of cost. We also looked at uh, what about the oncologic outcomes? Now, this didn't pan out because it wasn't significant, but we did see a surprising and interesting trend towards an increased median overall survival, about 30 months in the in the robotic group compared with the, now these are matched cases, so that's not like these are selected. Uh, and then time to recurrence uh, was longer in the robotic arm. Now, I would tell you that in another year or two, we'll have three times as many adenocarcinoma cases to look at this again. And I, sus I suspect it's going to come out significant. Okay. And remember, you know, it, U.S., people are not going to randomize. So it's never going to happen. It can happen in Germany and Netherlands and all that stuff, but it's not going to happen here. This was a... a we presented this last year at Stages in Montreal, uh, which has now been published, our 10-year review of, uh, of Whipples. And we looked at our database, REDCap database, and we had um, 1,400, over 1,400 robotic HPV cases in the la in, from 2011 to 2021, uh, which included 215 Whipples at the time. So we're close to 300 now. But we looked at outcomes, and we broke these 200 or so Whipples into high risk and low risk. And high risk are people who have obviously things like 
B higher BMI, higher ASA classification, other comp comorbidities and things like that. And uh, we looked at those. They also had higher risk of neoadjuvant therapy in the high risk group. But when we compared these, both the high risk and the low risk to the benchmark cutoff, the benchmark cutoff it was a paper published in Annals of Surgery by Pierre Clevien and about 30 international centers looking at what is the, what are the, what's a standard? What's a benchmark for a Whipple, an open Whipple, whether you're in Europe or Asia or South America or North America? And these are what the outcomes are. And if you look at our outcomes, we fall underneath the benchmark for things like operative time, length of stay. CCI, which is Comprehensive Comp Index, the post-op pancreatic fistula rate, uh, both post-operative bleeding and mortality. All of these were within the standard. So this is what your goal should be, is to have outcomes that are as good as the international benchmark for open Whipples. You look at that, that's where you're headed, okay? So conclusion, our robotic Whipple can be performed safely in high-risk patients. I think it's important to have experience doing these open before you start doing them robotically. And uh, we did find something, what we call a proficiency phase. That's different than using the term learning curve. I don't like the term learning curve because it, because it implies that you're done learning and you're never done. I'm not done learning. Everybody needs to understand that. It is a lifelong learning. And uh, that's important. And advice to the younger generation, you have to have the right attitude about this. Um, when I started out in robotics, I was very, very selective about what I was going to do. And I really think you need, if you want to do robotics, you need to get in there with easy cases, start out with easy cases and just start doing things right away. Don't jump into Whipples. It's really important. So with that, I think, uh, 643, um, right on time, I think. So I'm going to stop my share and. I think we'll go to discussions. Yeah, we are, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, outstanding presentation as I had already seen back in the past. So thank you very much indeed. And now we're going to open for discussion with panelists. I think that I will start maybe with Fabio. We want to start the questions with you, please. Thank you. Uh, congratulations, uh, Dr. Martini, for your brilliant presentation and very clear, very didactic and showing, demonstrating your huge experience in robotic pan pancreatic surgery. Thanks. Uh, and for for now, I'd like to make a few points. Uh, nowadays, there are many studies confirming the invalidation, the benefits of minimal invasive surgery for, for laparoscopic or robotic, minimal, minimal invasive uh, for distal pancreatectomies. And clearly, clearly there are great advantages of robotics in distal pancreatectomies when you are going to preserve the, the, the spleen, the splenic preservation or, or sac and preserve the splenic vessels. But for PD, uh, it's a, a little bit different because uh, for sure it is a most complex and technically demanding procedure with a high post-operative post uh, morbidity and uh, mainly related to pancreatic fistulas and bleeding. Uh, and uh, pancreatic fistulas are associated with uh, pancreatic fistulas and bleeding. And uh, the robotic approach, no doubt, led to a better quality of uh, reconstructions, uh, especially the pancreatic jejunal anastomosis. And uh, in my opinion, the image mag magnification, the 3D visions allowed a better lymphadenectomy with better vascular dissection. And uh, on the other side, there are more radical dissection of the vessels. Um, close, we work close to the vessels, and this could lead to a more frequently postoperative bleeding. Uh, 
What is your opinion about that? You told us that you have more lymph nodes now with your dissection robotic made. And uh, do you have any tips to reduce the chance of postoperative bleeding? You said us to, that you use the round ligament uh, patch, or do you use uh, a menton or even some hemostatic tissue to cover the main vessels, uh, such uh, portal vein or superior mesenteric artery or hepatic artery, gastrododenal stump? Because we have some uh, issues with uh, gastrododenal stump bleeding with that. And uh, do you have or do you use to cover your pancreatic or jejunal anastomosis with some tissue? And uh, another, if you uh, please could uh, give some tips about that issues. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, the, the, a lot to lot to answer there, but I'll, I'll say that, yeah, I mean, the GDA specifically, I've ne not had many problems with bleeding there because I'm, I'm very focused on technique of how I ligate clip and then cover the GDA stump with the round ligament. So the round ligament from the liver is brought down. It covers the stump of the GDA and it goes behind the pancreas anastomosis. So it covers the portal vein and the SMA. So if you get a leak from a PJ, it has no place to go posterior. It has to go anterior, which is where your drain is. That's number one. The bleedings that I see are either two locations, either they're bleeding from like an inferior pancreatic artery coming off that I didn't clip or didn't see, or on the proximal jejunal mesentery, because sometimes I get lazy and I'm just using like the ligature, like the vessel sealer. And now I'm much more careful about dissecting out the branches like a first jejunal artery, and I'll put clips there just to be very cautious. And those are the bleeds that I've seen as a delayed leak, first jejunal bleed. They're like seven days out from the Whipple, and then they bleed. <laughs> like, I want to know what, they should have been home. So that's real important. The, the part about the lymphadenectomy, I didn't have time to get into distal pancreatectomy. There was a time in my career where I would have told you that a laparoscopic distal panc and a robotic distal pank are the same thing. And I couldn't disagree with that more now. And we have the data to show it. So our lymphadenectomy for a robotic distal pancreatectomy is almost double. It's almost twice as many lymph nodes. And the reason when I'm doing an adenocarcinoma, I start with station eight lymph node way over by the, and I take that node and I do a full celiac lymphadenectomy. I can tell you that most people in the United States who do a laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy do not start with that lymph node station. They are way to the left, and it's a very different operation. So I do believe that it's true. We are we're changing the operation because we can, and I can do I can do a cancer operation the same with the same uh, fidelity, the same comprehensive that I would do open. But there was a time in my career that I couldn't do that. I just, I didn't know how to do it. I hope that answers that. Perfect. And uh, what are the cases in which you contraindicate a robotic approach? Uh, for What is your experience in, with a robotic portal vein resection? Do you have uh, this? Well, if I'm, if I'm doing like a Whipple, um, and uh, I know there's going to be a long segment vascular involvement and i know i'm going to be putting a graft in like a portal grain i i do those open to me it's just too much headache yeah i've done some i've done a couple interposition grafts that were you know we get in there you think you're going to get it off the vein and then there's tumor for about a centimeter to any you, you know you're already there but i generally speaking do those open from a technical standpoint yeah thank you I think you're muted, Zhao. Sorry, I was saying, I was 
I was inviting you to make your questions below too. <laughs> Congratulations, Professor Martini. This beautiful presentation. And Thank you. your opinion in pancreatic in pancreatic cancer, you routinely do mesopancreas and in the pancreatectomy, when you do pancreatic jejunostomy or pancreatic gastrostomy anastomosis. Only pancreatic jejunos anastomosis. Yeah, so um, I'll take the first part first, but the, the, this mesopancreas, I mean, it's it's a very, I'm not sure I understand that to begin with, first of all. Number two is if I'm dissecting, and some people talk about circumferentially divesting the lymphatics and vessels around the SMA and the celiac, to me, I'm just not sure about that. I, I sort of, um, I, I want to say I'm practical, but if you have cancer around the celiac on the left side of the SMA in the setting of a PDAC, I'm not sure that's surgically fixable, like to me. And I and I sort of, maybe because I'm afraid of being there. So I don't routinely, I mean, I come, I come right along the SMA and as I come through the uncinate, then you come into the, the posterior duodenal lymph node package. I think, what is it, a 12 or stations 12 or 13? So I take those lymph nodes, but I don't go up, around the vessels like that. Um, and I always feel um, inadequate when I'm watching these Japanese surgeons do this, these crazy dissections or Orlando for that matter. Um, the second part is I stopped doing PGs about 15 years ago. And the reason is I didn't like what I was seeing if patients were alive a year later and they had no pancreas left. The stomach would eat the pancreas. You'd ha if there was any parenchyma on a CT, it was all di di the di duct was dilated because it was all fibrotic. The stomach just chews apart the pancreatic stump. So, and I had the probably one patient. I, I can't believe I've ever done this, but I actually took took him back to the OR after about four years after a Whipple for for a gastrointestinal stromal tumor, and I did a pusto to the stump of the pancreas. It probably never been done before or since, but I just lo lost my affinity for PGs. That's not to say it's wrong. And look, it's a safe. We know it's safe. The probably the fistula rate is lower, right? There was some randomized studies that showed that the fistula rate is lower after PGs, but I just it's just technically not what I like to do. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, Pierre, and Pierre Julian I is a big fan of PGs and arguably one of the most experienced robotic surgeons in the world. And that's how he does all his whipples is a dunk. He dunks it into the back of the stomach, you know, like. So. Paul. Once again, I'd like to uh, thank uh, Nicholas for this invitation. It's a great course. Nice talk, John. Uh, I've been, uh, I've seen you do many operations, always nice. And my question is about when you have a borderline tumor and the tumors touch or uh, approach uh, is near for the SMA, you change your tech. You say, I do, I, I agree with you. The uh, studied lymphadenectomy is the most bad approach. But if you have a borderline tumor and tumor is near the SMA, what do you do? You change the operation, you do open, you do robotic, you do the total mesenteric uh, mesopancreas excision. Yeah, so for me, when when I have a, if I have a patient who's got tumor abutting the SMA or coming, those patients for me usually, I mean, there's going to be exceptions, but most of the time, you know you're going to be doing a segmental vein resection, right? It, it's just... I, unless you've got just a, a weird unstant tumor that's attaching, attacking the SMA, but leaving the SMB alone. So those are going to be patients that I typically will do open, you know, because I just, and so that takes the, you know, people talk a lot about this SMA, S, SMA first approach. Like for me, I, I don't know. I guess those are mainly, I, I don't feel comfortable doing those robotically. So those are mostly done open. 
Um, I suppose there may be some cases where you have abutment of the SMA without a long segment of the SMB involvement. And then I probably would go and do, you know, I would probably drop down to the, to the left of the SMB and come in the groove between the vein and the artery to see if there's tumor going into the artery. I mean, that's what I do open, right? I just don't, I don't find that I'm doing that robotically because those are going to be done open. And, you know, who knows, maybe in five years I get better and I start doing them robotically as well, but I just don't, I just don't do those. Those are about the five or 10% of the whiffles that I do are open. And those are, those are like, you know, you got to have your, your uh, game on for those. And you put the drain in all cases or selected cases and when you remove the drain. Yeah, I drain everybody. But it's just, I had a, I've had a run this spring. I must have had three or four really bad leaks that just, you know, I, I literally the, the last two weeks I started putting two drains in. One from one from the right goes behind the pancreas and astomosis, and one from the left that goes in front. So, you know, um, there's nothing worse than getting a post-op leak or fistula um, that you can't drain. You know, the radiologists tell you you can't drain. So I I'm putting a drain behind the PJ, kind of laying along the retroperitoneum and then one in the front nowadays. Um, and I, we do, we do drain amylase on day three, like everybody. And then we drain it. We take it out when it's a clinically appropriate, you know, the output is low and the amylase is low. We, we, so we track every single fistula. We know what our, our B and C fistula rates about 10%, which is about the same as it is open. And our, biochemical leaks or your a fistulas is about another 10 10 to 15 percent um and we don't we don't worry too much about those you know those strains come out we don't use octreotide or anything like there was a time in my career where we used octreotide on everybody and i stopped using that because it's expensive and i don't think it works thank you i'll see you in my hip right? oh i'll be there i'm gonna have some caprinas waiting for me i hope <laughs> Not too many. Not too many. <laughs> too oh, many. <laughs> Hi, John. Nice presentation. Thank you. And uh, uh, I have two questions. Two, only two questions for you. Okay. I saw that you use scissors, but uh, have you already used the rook? When I first started, uh, two thousand and six. I made the decision that I was going to learn how to use the scissors really well. And when you start using the scissors really well, you don't need the hook. You can use the two tips of the scissors. The very tips are very not sharp at all. So you can use the scissors like, like a hook and lift and burn and lift and burn. But the scissors you can cut and the scissors you can use like a Maryland. And early on, I was also using the, the Maryland dissector. And I just found that I didn't need a Maryland dissector. So just to eliminate the scissors, you can use in a variety of techniques. And I just, it takes a little, once you get used to it, you know, you, you won't go back to the hook, in my opinion. The other question is about what, what can a robotic surgeon still offer more for a surgeons? Any special instrument or the possibility of another surgeon in the same field in another console. What do you think? What's the future? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, you would think they could have, I mean, first of all, there are surgeons who, when they're training residents or fellows will use one of the arms. And so the fourth arm, because the, the residents and fellows are learning on arm number one and arm number three, and then the fourth arm, they're not using as much. So you can, you could theoretically build a robot with another arm. So there's five arms, one camera, and each surgeon has two hands. I mean, I think that's certainly a feasible possibility. Um, I'm not sure that the companies are running out to to do that because then you would have to have two surgeons there. And that's, um, that's not necessarily the way that I do things. But I do think that the future is going to be more and more um, guided surgery. Like, here's an example. The new robot just came out in the United States called DV5. Um, it's going to have the ability to 
allow surgeons to feel because there's force feedback. And so along with that, they can then incorporate, hey, you know, if you've got a general surgeon doing a cholecystectomy and the robot can figure out where the bile duct is, then they could prevent the surgeon from moving their arms to the, to the um, you know, their right, the left to be in the wrong spot. A lot of bile duct injuries happen because the surgeons, they don't know where they're at. They're lost. So this is kind of the area that I think is going to be more and more um, built into these systems. It's kind of like, you know, uh, some of the cars like Tesla's, I don't know if there are Teslas in, in Brazil, but Tesla's an electric car in the United States and it ha it can drive itself now, you know, go down the road. It gets off, it fears you back. I don't have a Tesla. I have a Toyota pickup truck and, you know, not fancy, but it tells me when I'm drifting out of my lane, it'll, it'll tell me, Hey, you know, stop for a coffee or something, you know, it'll tell me, Hey, get out, get back in your lane. So this is the way I think robotics is going to help us. It's going to help the younger surgeons. It's probably going to help me, uh, older surgeon, help kind of keep us in in the lane if I'm not paying attention. And that's that's really the big the big future. Uh, I'm not. Uh, do you have another question, Kota? Oh, for me is enough. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm I'm not panelist, but uh, if you allow me, I would like to ask you something. So, how often do you use the uh, echography in your in your pancreatic surgery? Every time, or is a tool that you use every time that you make a, a pancreatic resection, or just sometimes when you're in doubt of something? What, what was it that I used? Yeah, uh, ultrasound. Ultrasound. Yeah, I use the ultrasound on every case that I do, and the reason I use it on every case I do is because it doesn't cost a penny. It's in my OR, it's there every day. And because I use it every day, it's always there, right? It's like kind of like the argument for doing routine uh, cholangiography. If I use it selectively, then it would be like, oh, then if I ask for it, then they'd be like, oh, well, it's not in the room. We didn't know you wanted it. So the fact that it's there every case, I it, it allows me to depend on it. So even if I'm doing a cholecystectomy, I mean, most of the gallbladders that I do are not straightforward, right? They're gallbladder cancers or bad, bad things. Um, so it's always available. It's kind of like the firefly on the robot. You just flip it on and it's there. You know, every case patients get ICG so I can see the bile duct. Um, ultrasound is there. And if you use it, then you become really good at interpreting ultrasound. You know, when I first started, like, I didn't know how to do ultrasound. I mean, like, who did ultrasound, right? This, you know, coming out of residency 20 years ago, the only ultrasound we did was to, you know, look at, um, you know, traumas for looking at fluid on a, a trauma, what they call a fast exam. But now I use I use ultrasound on so many things. It makes me makes me better, you know, makes me a better surgeon. And I can do more with it. And I, that video I showed of, of looking at the SMA, like there's, there, it's so comforting to know, look at that and be like, okay, I know where the SMA is. I'm, I'm like two centimeters away from the SMA. I've got plenty of space, so I'm much more comfortable doing things. It's an important tool to, to master. So uh, uh, the question is, you use uh, very from the very beginning, or you use yep. uh, when you go to resect the neck or the pancreas. So, okay. So for specifically for Whipple, so I do two things. One, as soon as bef before I ligate the gastroduodenal artery, I put a clamp and I make sure that there's flow in the hepatic artery. And I do it as a technical exercise to teach the fellows that skill set. Same thing. Number two is if, if I'm doing a distal pank, I'm going to put the bulldog clamp on the splenic artery to make 125% sure that I'm about to ligate the splenic artery and not the hepatic artery. Okay. There's nothing worse than ligating the wrong artery. Sure. And same, same thing goes for, I'm going to ultrasound before I divide the uncinate to make sure I see the SMA, make sure there's not a replace right coming up behind that. I didn't see on the CAT scan because maybe the patient had a, 
a not high quality CAT scan without conscious that you just missed an you missed a replaced right hepatic artery and it, it happens. So I think ultrasound and it's going to be more and more integrated with these robotic uh, systems. So they're going to have navigation. They're going to have like 3D planning that they put a 3D angi angiography into the picture that you'll be able to see the blood vessels when you're doing, for example, a liver resection. You'll be able to see the branches of the portal vein and the hepatic artery superimposed into the laparoscopic image. So this is a, a thing that all the surgeons that are doing liver and pancreas need to do ultrasound. You need to really become an expert in got, you know, looking at your own CT scans and MRIs that you would think that would be like basic, like everyone would do that. But I guess there's some people that don't do that. But it's really, I think, an important aspect of doing minimally invasive surgery. Sure. And, and it goes with that goes with non robotic stuff too. I mean, I, if I was do, still doing lap, but I, I don't do anything laparoscopic anymore. It's, it's all, all robot. Okay. Oh. Uh, John, hold on. Uh, uh, yeah. So, how often in the United States you have a bad scan and you can't know preoperatively when the patient has uh, anatomic variations? How often? It's not so so common. Right? You, you used to have you used to know preoperatively the vascular anomalies and yeah, I mean, you. I would say maybe ten or twenty percent of my patients have some significant vascular anomaly, right? Replace right or you know separate right and lefts, or you know today, I mean, the right hepatic artery was going in front of the bile duct, which you know, it's not terrible, but it's just, you've got to, you've got to know it and retract it out of your way. Um, but we try to, we try not to overscan patients, which we are very guilty of in the United States because we, we waste a lot of money. Um, typical patient might get four or five scans before they get to the operating room. Um, but at the same time, you're, if you're operating, you, you need a good, CT scan with with intravenous contrast before you do a Whipple. It's just there's you just can't have a surprise a case like that. So I I do repeat those. Yeah. What? The? John, you're talking of course about the Da Vinci platform. Have yeah. you been using other robotic platform? You see any on the rise? I have seen a lot of different platforms and um, I don't, I've not used one outside of a laboratory setting. Um, I would say many of the systems, uh, the Japanese Hinatori, the Korean robot, um, some of the other robots out there that are boom uh, design, like as they have a boom and the arms come down I think those are all going to be very, very similar. The question, the, and they'll look similar. The question is, do they do the same thing? And I don't know that. Um, I will say the the big the big player uh, is going to be Medtronic, and the problem with their system is is not fixable because you got now four big pieces of equipment around the table and. Yet, when you sit down, once you get it all loaded up, I mean, it works just fine. I mean, I've used it in a laboratory setting, and it works great, you know. The problem is you've got four giant arms placed around the patient. So I think that they're going to have to – I my advice is they're going to have to go to a boom system. They're just going to have to build where you've got a big arm that comes over and drop the arms down. And that's the, that's the way all these systems really need to work, you know. I just – there's some others like Cambridge Medical that has arms that attach to the table. And that's certainly kind of a neat thing. Um, I don't know. I've not used that. I saw it when I was down in uh, with the meeting in Rio. I think they were there at the uh, SRS meeting and that was in, in Rio last year. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of cool things coming out. I think, you know, like 10 years from now, it'll be like, uh, you know, electric cars. You know, uh, 10 years ago, there, there was only one electric car in North America. Now. I mean, now there's everything. You can drive a Ford Ford pickup truck and a Mercedes, BMW. Everybody's got electric cars. Um, so I think in, in 10 years, we're going to have a lot of different choices for robotics. And you kind of find what you like and what what what's economical, what you can use. 
I mean, they need to build a Brazilian robot, you know, that, I mean, that's a big problem is, is, you know, the, the cost markup on some of these systems because they're not made in, in Brazil. Right. And there's a, the tariff on some of these, like a vessel sealer, for example, as I understand it, you know, like a vessel sealer, what you guys have to pay for a vessel sealer compared to what I pay for the vessel sealer, it's like twice as much. You know, and that's that's not right. It should be it should be less. Fabio Bellotto, another question? Nothing. Nothing question. Yeah. Uh Please, Dr. Martini, do you leave uh, the stand on in the thin ducts? Uh, it's routinely made or not for thin ducts, the ductal tomocosa anastomosis? For the pancreas? For the pancreas, um, yes. I, I, I leave stents in most patients. Um, I mean, the exception would be if I have a pancreatic duct that's, let's say, six, eight millimeters or, or more dilated. Um, and then I don't, but the fact is that most, most of these patients, by the time I re-image them with a scan post-operatively, most of their stents have migrated to their small bowel or colon. So they don't stay in. I mean, for the most part, I, maybe I've had one, one or two patients over the years whose stent was still in place and we felt was causing a problem with the pancreatic, uh, and, you know, obstruction or something, but it's generally speaking, it's not a problem. Yeah. The same thing we do open. I mean, if I, if I'm doing open Whipple, I, I'm, I understand that there's a kind of a lack of good level one randomized data on the fish, fistulas and stenting, but I, I still use them on most of my smaller ducts. And uh, you think this can degree, uh, diminish the, the fistula, uh, the incidence of the fistulas? Or well, it still facilitate the osmosis for you. It makes me feel better. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I suppose um, scientifically, if I was if I was a believed in scientist and I wasn't superstitious, I probably would not use stents. But because most people don't believe that there's data that shows that, but I I don't know. I mean, and I when I even if there's a non if even if there's a slight chance it might work in a handful of patients to reduce fistulas, I'm going to use it. And I'm, you know, th there's nothing worse than a, than a, a pancreatic fistula, as you know, in a Whipple. And um, uh, that's just the way I, I do things. And I think, I think it's whatever I've done has helped our fistula rate be pretty good compared to our open and, and pretty good compared to the benchmarks and, Certainly, if you look at some of the more recent, I mean, the German study that came out this year from uh, from uh, Heidelberg, was it Heidelberg or Hamburg with Thilo Hacker? I mean, they had a 58% pancreas complication rate. I don't know if that means B and C fistulas, but that's really high. I mean, if more than half your patients are having B and C fistulas, I mean, that's that's not good. You know, for sure. So you might as well go back to doing PGs, right? That's something. Yeah. Thank you, João. We well, have time for more questions. For uh, yeah, yeah, uh, maybe another one, and then the the, the other is going to be on June. <laughs> well, let's, <laughs> let's go back, uh, John. When the, you have a patient with high level of bilio, Ruben, which yeah. drainage route you prefer, endoscopically or? Trace Yeah. Well, it's it's not it's not usually a decision that I'm making. It's usually made for me. So, you know, patients with jaundice, uh, they come through the emergency room, they're gonna get sent to gastroenterology before we get ever called. Um, so I would say um most patients are gonna have an endoscopic uh biliary stent placed. Um and, um, you know, it's the patient who have had gastric bypasses who can't, then they'll get a percutaneous transhepatic drain. Um, you know, you could make the argument that this should have no biliary manipulation because it leads to increased uh, complications and infections. But that's just not the way it works most places in the U.S. And I will say that, um, you know, I I don't 
have a big problem with that. I mean, because I need their diagnostic intervention anyway. So they need an ERCP to tell me, hey, is this a cholangic carcinoma? Is this an ampullary carcinoma? Uh, is it a PDAC? Um, is it just stones, you know? So I kind of need that. And and they're going to be doing usually an e endoscopic ultrasound as well. So I kind of let the gastroenterologist make that decision for me. It's, I cannot tell you, I probably have not operated on someone who presented like with painless jaundice and a pancreas mass without an intervention. I, I probably have never done that in my life. Or maybe that may be strong to say, maybe in the last 15 years, I've not done that. I mean, there may have been a time when I came out of my training 15 years ago where I, I took a patient right from the ER presents with painless jaundice with a mass and take them straight to the OR. It just, it just doesn't, it doesn't happen really in North, in, in my practice, probably in many places in North America. I know. It seems just, one crazy. More question. Yeah. just one more question. Follow? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Sure, sure. Go ahead. John, you yeah. said that most of cases you do the operation alone. That's right. Yeah, well, what I mean by that, I'm not, I'm certainly not alone, but I, but I don't have a second surgeon attend. I don't have a second surgeon at the bedside, like with a ligature or something like that. The only time that happens is when I'm in Barreto's, you know, and I have, I have one of the yeah. faculty. The only time I have one, usually I have a surgical tech at the bedside, a tech. Um, sometimes I have like a junior resident. But my fellow is always sitting next to me. We have two consoles, so there we're two seats. So I'm training, I'm doing things, and I give them a task to do: tie this, suture this, do this. Um, so, but that's not many. Many people in the U.S. have train it where there's a bedside surgeon and a console surgeon. But if you're the person at the bedside, you're not learning robotics. So if you're a fellow, you know, you're not getting to operate really as much as you would think. You're with the suction or the ligature at the bedside. And, you know, that's just not the way I do it. But okay. I'm definitely not alone. And I have a lot of people helping. Yes. Can I? Sure. Love you. you know, here in Brazil, there are laws, there are rules that you that you cannot be al alone uh, alone yeah yes do not allow to a single surgeon to be in the or uh, operating room without an assistant uh, surgeon especially, especially in more complex surgeries yeah. and uh, another point is that some device like robotic staplers or even clips and embolocks are very expensive here so we need to have a uh, usually we need to to have a, a good a very experienced bedside surgeon here in brazil yeah i think that that's probably a good idea i mean you know if we had that regulation in the us it, it probably would do well for a lot of our uh, uh less skilled surgeons yeah, yeah. Uh, i have a question from the sh from the from the uh, audience they yeah. sent through the chat so concerning the, so, uh, they said the uh, Dr. Daniel Paulino Santana about postoperative robotic whipple runs with less adhesions. Any tip for high flow fistulas? Leave the drain and wait or any intervention or procedure to help? Mm. Or a high, high flow fistula, yeah. High, high output fistulas, how to manage high output fistulas. Well, most fistulas, um, oh, this is my experience, most most pancreatic fistulas um, are low output unless you have an obstruction of the biliopancreatic limb so that you're getting bile and pancreas juice out that leak. So it's a biliopancreatic fistula. It's not just a pancreas fistula because the, the, the whole limb is obstructed for some reason. I, I just had one of these. So I actually took that patient back to the operating room to put wash out, put in additional drains. But now you can't fix that. You got to just let it declare itself. So the only trick at all in that situation is we'll sometimes have radiology put in a transhepatic biliary catheter that goes distal 
away from the pancreas. So you're going away from the candy cane and that helps divert the bile. So it converts a biliopancreas fistula to just a pancreas fistula by diverting the bile away. That sometimes is very helpful. But in general, it's really just weighted out. And I mean, it's, I think it's maybe very, not, I don't want to say foolish. It's to think you can just, in the setting, you're five or seven days out from a Whipple and you have a, a leak from your pancreas. To think you're going to go in and surgically fix that is sometimes just not going to happen. Unless, unless you don't have a drain or something or there's some other problem. Most of the time, these leaks, and we get leaks, you know, I showed you, um, and it's best managed with just adequate draining. If you don't have adequate drainage, then you need to have radiology, put another drain in, or you need to go back to the OR laparoscopically if you can, wash them out, put in new drains. Drain, just drain and drain and drain. And, um, you know, you come back to fight another day. My philosophy, but I mean, I could be wrong. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, I would like to thank you very much indeed. We had uh, the same yeah. time of lecture as we had in discussions. It was great. It was great. The, Love yeah, that. It was the, the presentation that we had the, the biggest discussion. And uh, so I'd, I'd like to thank you. Thank you all the panelists. Yeah. And hope to see you soon at Barretos. <laughs> All right, God. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation and and to all the panelists for the questions. And um, I, you know, my favorite thing in the world to do is to come down to Barreiros. So uh, uh, <laughs> I'll see you all soon. Okay. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you all, guys. Bye. See right. you. Bye. Bye. See you soon. Uh, see you.